Yo, what's up? It's someone that's someone, and welcome back to another story mix. Today we're getting into a handful of dextromethorphan experiences, the common over-the-counter cost suppressor that can act as a dissociative substance in high doses. We've covered this substance quite a bit on the channel, so I wanted to gather some of the best ones to showcase what this substance can do. And we got quite the variety of reports here. There's favorable trips, and then there's rough ones. I'm pretty sure we'll be covering all the four plateaus, there will be some with polystorex, there's a report that covers taking DXM with a CYP2D6 deficiency, then there's even a report that will bring up using DXM for opioid withdrawal. This is an experience that can go many ways, but one common thing is that it is embodied by feelings and affects the dissociation, which you'll hear a lot of. But today, we do have a collab going down, this one being a first with the homie Trip Reports. What's up everyone, this is Trip Reports YT. Shout out to someone that's no one for the collab. Subscribe to his channel if you haven't already. Let's get into it. We'll have a collab on his channel too soon, so stay tuned for that. But besides that, I do want to know many of the stories I've taken today are from back in the day. Another reason I'm making these compilations is to bring back old content that I had to remove due to YouTube's guidelines at the time. And presenting it under this format makes it a lot easier than going one by one. So because of that, the quality of each story will vary. Also, we're doing this to highlight the stories more too. Most reports I make today do have an intro and some with an outro where I break it down. With this, you'll just get the straight up stories. But besides that, if you want to see more videos like this, if you already know, hit the like button and subscribe. Let me know what substance you want to see next, but without further ado, let's dive right into this. Fascinating DXM My friend and I decided to try a fourth plateau trip on DXM together. 1,062 mg DXM, 3 bottles of Robitussin, 50 mg DPH, attempt to counteract nausea, not to co-trip. 1 gallon white grapefruit juice and a single plain bagel each for the 20 hours before. My prior experience with psychedelics slash dissociatives included only an earlier third plateau trip a few weeks before, salvia and borderline psychedelic doses of weed, to the point of geometry. Before you say it, I know, I was definitely a little too courageous. My friend had done everything you can name at least once, and at one point a few years back was using lower doses of DXM frequently, but never third slash fourth plateau and hadn't touched it since. I'll skip the uninteresting parts that you can get from any DXM trip report, like projectile vomiting syrup and the expected dissociation, and I'll get to the goods. Perhaps from lack of tolerance, my body had a very bad reaction to the stuff and I couldn't really enjoy the trip's peak. My mind would spend some time in a hallucinatory place, usually a static image of an inexplicable object, or a color field, or nothingness before getting ripped back to reality by heavy breathing or my heart beating too fast, or perhaps another bout of nausea. At one point, our friend stepped in, not knowing what we were up to, and he reported afterward that I seemed like I was in intense physical slash mental distress. That's all nothing very unusual, pretty much what you'd expect of a bad DXM trip. However, my experience had some worthwhile moments. Later in the day, after I made it back to my place, aided by a sober friend, I was lounging around waiting for the trip to subside enough for me to get some sleep. Perhaps from the white grapefruit juice, I entered a state I can only describe as semi-sigma. All the sigma effects were there, but only to a moderate extent, and I was still cognitively lucid, i.e. aware that delusions were caused by a trip and generally able to figure out what was real and what wasn't. I even had the notorious wacky cam, where closing my eyes would show me whatever scene I was looking at before, but with dreamlike delusional additions, all completely nonsensical. And the most fantastic effect of all, something I've never heard anyone report from a trip besides a few DXM slash DPH accounts. Staring at the ceilings, the textured bumps would start to move and rearrange and swirl in patterns, but it wouldn't stop there the swirling patterns would start to come out of the ceiling and form three-dimensional objects coming out at me, 
all made still out of the same textured dots. Like this, look at the screen, but without the wires between the dots. I remember a formless beautiful fractal spiral coming out at me, a dragonfly forming from these dots and coming down at me, and a flower, all very clearly. I could reset the condensation of these objects by double taking. It was very beautiful and helped me calm down after the incredibly unpleasant height of the trip. Even more fascinating than that was my friend's experience. We haven't had a chance to talk for too long, but he says that at the peak of the trip, his consciousness was off in some alien world with light beings who lived according to their own physics. This is actually semi-common with 4th Plateau DXM dosages, if I understand correctly. He said it was hard to remember much of the experience and much of what the beings had to say to him, but that it was very pleasant and that he felt welcomed into this strange world. Incredibly, when the aforementioned friend stepped into the room and tried to talk to my fellow tripper, he responded, friend's name is not here right now, but he's okay. Our, so our unexpected visitor, reports. My friend says that he did not actively perceive, see, or otherwise experience this interaction. But while he was in dissociative headspace land, he for a moment felt the presence of this friend. It is bizarre and incredibly interesting to think that some automatic subconscious process could generate a linguistic response like that while the conscious mind was otherwise occupied. It's times like this that I wish I was a neuroscientist and that all this psychonautics was happening in a controlled environment with proper neurological observation. But stranger than that was that about four hours in, my friend gets a text from his girlfriend about something and has to go meet her. And he does. All while I'm still more or less wreathing around, lost in some kind of cognitive time loop and feeling very sick, if feeling anything at all. He made sure I was alright with him leaving first, of course. He somehow managed to put himself together and act normal enough that people didn't realize he was on anything serious. He said this was difficult, pretty much focusing his complete attention on staying associated. I presume former experience with DXM and other drugs meant he had a pretty good grasp on how to handle himself under the influence. A few days later, he smoked some weed, normal amount, in his words, only one hit, and blacked out. His buddy says that he became completely nonsensical the whole time he was blacked out, and was constantly laughing and pretty much had to lay down. Very bizarre thing, especially for a guy who smokes a lot. Definitely related somehow to the DXM. So, yeah, rough summary is that DXM is weird and has potential to not be a fun time. You probably all knew that before, but I feel it's worth getting slightly unusual reports out there for the public conscious, harm reduction, etc. I had physical opiate addiction for 6 years. Now I have been without opiates and other addictive substances for 4 months not counting caffeine and nicotine, thanks for dextromethorphan. There are a few medicines that could help with opiate withdrawal. Benzodiazepines and barbiturates are good for muscle pain, cold sweat, and other physical symptoms, but they don't do much for the craving of opiates, and they are too addictive to be taken for two weeks on large doses. Fortunately, I found DXM. There is no drug that helps so greatly during withdrawal. On doses 300 mg twice a day for the first week and 300 mg daily for second week, I managed to stop abusing PO opium without severe symptoms and the same with dosing IV buprenorphine 4 mg per day. That's almost too easy to stop. I've gone through years of suffering, trying to withdraw, relapsing, cold sweat, pain, and desperation, and there has been the whole time a relatively easy solution. DXM causes some withdrawal symptoms, but they are nothing compared to opiate withdrawal. Those are symptoms that are easy to combat with good hashish and Valium twice a day for less than a week. Typical withdrawal day begins with awakening from a nightmare, followed by pain in the muscles and joints, coldness, shaking, sweat, and extreme yawning, not to mention a craving for anything that helps. 
Then I gulped down 100 milliliters, 3 milligrams per milliliter, cough syrup. It tastes absolutely awful, but is worth suffering. I lay back trying not to throw up and start moving my legs to find a less painful position for them. After half an hour, it is possible to keep them still, and on the one hour mark, it is possible to light a cigarette, smoke some hashish, and eat. No much pain left, only some yawning, and most amazingly, I can feel almost warm. Effects last from a few hours to over 12 hours depending on opiate and DXM tolerance. It is interesting that when I am physically dependent off opiates, there is not much psychedelic properties to DXM, but after a couple of weeks, the same dose that before only curd withdrawal symptoms, making it possible to buy some food, not to mention more cough syrup, made it impossible to leave the house. When planning to withdraw from opiates with DXM, one must be extremely careful. It's not for everyone. I can handle it. I have survived it, and now I'm clean, but it is only my subjective point of view. There may be risk of convulsion, insanity, and even death. I don't know enough. Maybe no one knows. Before starting to even consider the possibility of a homemade detox with DXM, study some neuropharmacology. Read about Olney's lesions and reconsider. I remember to stop using DXM after 2-3 to three weeks. It's easy to get hooked to that stuff. Psychologically. Maybe physically. Now I know it. There is life after opiates. At first, life is hard and empty, but it gets easier each day. Now I can visit my friends, watch them inject opiates, not wanting a little bit of that shit. I'm left feeling only sad for them, that they don't realize that it is possible to break free from chemical slavery and get your life back. That's it. Be careful, consider, get information, reconsider, and seek better ways to exist. And don't forget to feel empathy. This trip report took place on the day my cousin was celebrating his birthday party, which was on 420. It started off like any other day, but I had to go to my cousin's house to hang out with him for his birthday. Nothing eventful took place until after the party was over. At around maybe 8 p.m., after everyone was long gone from the party, me and my cousin, we will call Jerry, decided to walk to our friend Tyler's house to see if he wanted to hang out at the pier by the lake and he agreed. After me and Jerry and Tyler went back to Tyler's house, he was looking in his dad's cabinet and found a package containing three 450 milligram Robocoff bottles in it and gave it to us for free. So me and Jerry went back to the pier. I had a close inspection on these bottles to make sure the only active ingredient was DXM, and it was. So I read online about dosages and decided to give Jerry one bottle, 450 milligrams, and I will take two, 900 milligrams, which was a bad idea to start with because I was short and did not weigh much at the time, and my cousin weighed much more than me. If you don't know, Rebukov comes in a 5 hour energy type bottle so me and Jerry downed them pretty fast and then walked up to his house for my mom and dad to take us home. During the car ride home I wasn't feeling the effects or nausea but Jerry was complaining of having motion sickness. After we had gone home a family friend had come over with her boyfriend and two daughters. Me and Jerry went into my room and I started feeling the effects very quickly. I became very dizzy and had no motor skills at all and neither did Jerry. I had decided I was too messed up and needed to go to sleep so I took 3 melatonin and laid on the floor. Every time I closed my eyes I was in pure bliss and it felt as if I was a part of the floor. I didn't want to get up but now I was beginning to see something when my eyes were closed. While I was lying on the floor I could feel it moving under me almost like a treadmill track and in my head I was seeing the bottom of a car driving on a road. My dad comes in the room saying something, but I couldn't remember what, and then Jerry says, watch out, and pukes on my dad's feet and stands up to go to the bathroom, but slams into the wall and collapses to the floor and starts throwing up face down onto my jacket as my mother comes. My dad is yelling at Jerry, and I desperately try to help the situation by repeating that, I'll clean it, it's okay. Don't worry about it. 
and my dad was pretty mad. Later, as I'm laying in the floor, Jerry says he is going to apologize to my parents and say we are drunk. I beg him to stop, but he doesn't listen. My mom comes in the room after Jerry comes back and tells us to eat bread because it will absorb the alcohol and gives us two pieces. Jerry tells me to eat mine, but I won't as I wasn't hungry. So he throws it on my face and it sunk into my face, I thought, and I couldn't feel it anymore. As I try to close the door, Jerry tells me to keep it open. I ask him why, and he says because he gets mad when it's closed and will swing on me if I do not open it. And for some reason, I nearly burst into tears as I tell him, I'm so sorry, please don't. Jerry then tells me, you didn't tell me it would get us this fucked up, with a grin. The family friend's kids decided to mess with us and start knocking on the door and open it as they laugh demonically and echoey and run away. Jerry then starts saying he is getting angry and wants to swing on someone and tells my mom as she checks in on us. I sit up and tell Jerry I'm going to die and he says I'm going to be okay and I tell him we are overdosing, we are both dying right now and he doesn't believe me. I then stand up after about 5 minutes. I run to the bathroom as quick as I can and puke blood red liquid and the family friend comes in and asks me what I took and admitted it to her and told her not to tell but she does anyways. Then everyone comes in to check on me and I beg them to check on Jerry in my room. He was okay but he was on a video call. Jerry comes into the bathroom where I have a blanket and I am laying in the floor and he hangs out with me. This made me feel better. But then my dad comes in and starts reading news reports about people dying while on DXM. That freaks out me and Jerry. Jerry cooks a chicken nuggets and fries microwave meal and offers me a chicken nugget. But as I bit into it, it felt as if it was completely dry and tasted so bland but terrible at the same time. And I instantly spit it into the toilet and start gagging and throw up. My heart is racing at this point. It felt like I was going to have a heart attack and I keep twitching very badly. My mom comes in, and me and Jerry cry out that we are sorry, and we fucked up over and over, and she understood. And I kept begging her for a hug to make me feel better, but she won't. After I am done throwing up in the bathroom, like an hour later maybe, me and Jerry army crawl into the living room where everyone is, and exclaim to the family friend's boyfriend not to do it. It's terrible. My dad says we must stay awake until it is completely worn off, and we will talk about it in the morning. I end up falling asleep around 2 because I was so tired, but I woke up in the middle of the night and everyone was asleep and I was happy to be alive. I saw what looked like the stars in the sky on a time lapse all on my wall and ceiling of the living room. Overall, I would not recommend high doses of DXM. I do not regret doing it because I learned a lesson to never do DXM again after this. Well, to begin this story, I'd like to give a little bit of my background. I was fairly inexperienced with any form of drugs in high school with the exception of drinking alcohol and a few joints among some friends of mine. And I pretty much kept in the straight and narrow. After graduating from high school, however, I felt the need to experiment with some psychedelics. For what reason? I'm not really sure. Curiosity, more than likely. I heard about DXM from a friend of mine on the internet. I had wanted to try LSD instead, but someone told me DXM was more fun, at least from his personal experience. I wondered where I could acquire this aforementioned drug, and he told me that I could locate it in the medicine section of my local pharmacy. He also gave me the address of a very good FAQ, so I could research it, as well as keep it from killing myself by downing a bottle or two of NyQuil. I was a little apprehensive at first. I noticed all the warnings about brain damage and kidney failure, which, although rare, still frightened me. However, after reading through the entire FAQ, I found that you could do this drug safely, without falling prey to the DXM boogeyman. So, 
I resolved to try it. I went to the local Big Bear and bought a four-ounce bottle of Robitus in maximum strength. I didn't want to get too high on my first trip, so I only drank two ounces, which was 177 milligrams, consistent with a low second plateau dose. I was so anxious that I was practically bouncing around the room in a childlike giddiness. However, after about 30 minutes, I noticed no real effects. I was disappointed. So, I decided to go out for a drive. While I was driving, I noticed a slight nausea and discovered it was very pleasurable to yawn. However, driving was making me sick so I resolved to find some place to stop. It was a clear night, so I decided to drive out to a local lake and lie out under the stars. Once I had arrived at the lake, I began playing some music from my tape deck. I was amazed. It sounded glorious. Every note seemed to reverberate through me, and it seemed to have a hidden dimension that was now revealed to me. I must have sat there listening to music for a good three hours. I had a profoundly decent experience, as well as a drunken, stoned-like buzz in general. The next morning, I was in an excellent mood, probably better than I ever had been. Life seemed to have a new, profound meaning to it. I eventually discussed this experience with a few of my friends, and finally persuaded them to try it with me. We took a couple of trips. I didn't increase my dosage very greatly, spacing each trip by at least a week. We all had a blast. I would almost go as far as to say that it forged a new bond between a few of my friends and myself. They thanked me for telling them about this drug, since they had only gone as far as alcohol and marijuana. Well, to get to my profound and inspiring trip, I'll skip ahead to the fifth time I tried it. I had purchased a new container of Robitus and Honey Cough. The other flavor seemed to make me very nauseous now, but I could stand the taste of Honey Cough. I asked if my friends were up to tripping with me, but they declined, and said they had plans to drink that night. I told them it was okay, but I wanted a trip anyways. With some reluctance, I managed to chug that 4-ounce bottle of honey cough, 10 milligrams per 5 millimeters, making it 4 ounces roughly 236 milligrams of TXM. I decided that it wouldn't be as much fun just to do a second plateau trip if nobody else was doing it, so I said that I was going to go pick up some more HC. I drove to the store and returned with two more bottles. This took about 10 minutes at which time I noticed I was beginning to get a little nauseous. I made the mistake of running from my car back to the house, and realizing I left the bottles in my car. I ran back to the car, grabbed them, and ran back to the house again. All this exertion made me feel horribly nauseous, and I almost puked. If it were not for a swig of Pepto-Bismol and some intense willpower, I probably would have spilled my guts. But I managed to hold it in. I came back in and noticed I had reached the first plateau. My friends, who were drinking inside, saw the bottles and asked, You're not going to drink all of that, are you? I told them I had no intention of drinking both bottles, just one more, and the other one would be for anyone else who was up for some. After about 15 or 20 minutes of light conversation, I hit the second plateau and said that I might want to take another bottle. My friend said I should probably wait since I was still kind of nauseous and they didn't want my lunch revisited on their nice carpet. After maybe another five minutes, everyone who was drinking started talking about going to a party a few blocks away. I told them I couldn't go because moving around would make me sick to my stomach. They agreed and decided to go without me. After they all left, I went into the bathroom and poured the next bottle of honey cough into a drinking mug and chugged the entire thing. 
increasing my dosage to 472 milligrams of DXM, which is about 7.8 milligrams per kilograms. I came back out and was nauseous again, but not as badly this time. The general sick feeling went away after about two minutes this time. I felt totally wasted, but in a good way. Two of my friends, one who lives there and his girlfriend, came back in to keep an eye on me. Actually, I think they came back to make out, but they told me they would keep an eye on me. It seemed like they were gone for about ten minutes, but they told me they had went into the hallway for about three minutes. They conversed with me for a good while during the trip, although I don't recall much of the actual conversation. I gave my friend the other bottle and told him to use his discretion, intoxicated as it may be, of whether to allow me to consume it. I think I began to enter the transition stage a few minutes later. After this point, I am unable to timestamp any of the events due to DXM's memory encoding nature. We had a strobe light going, and any time it would flash, there would be these big black dots right in front of my eyes. I laughed about it and perceived them as my pupils. It was unusual, however, because they would not always move with my line of sight. They were more or less stationary, unless I really readjusted my vision. They eventually went away, after I stopped looking at the light. I think this was simply my loss of stereoscopic vision. At some point, I decided that I wanted to consume the rest of the remaining bottle. My friend advised me against it, and told me if I was determined, to at least just take half. So I took his advice, and drank another two ounces of the syrup, put in my dosage to 590 milligrams, which is about 9.7 milligrams per kilogram. However, a few minutes later, and behind my friend's back, I drank the rest of the syrup, put in me at 11.7 milligrams per kilogram. This was when I really started tripping. I was utterly fascinated with the actions of my friends, as well as my own hands. They seemed so foreign to me, and looked so unusual and useless, as far as tools go. And I don't remember much of what I said, and I'm told most of it was gibberish. I was still sitting up, so I decided to lie down. Then, the hallucinations started. Hallucinations were vague and transparent in manner. If I readjusted my vision, it would phase in and trigger a mild hallucination, usually if there was little or no light in the direction I was looking. I would see into walls and see things hanging on them that weren't actually there. Most of the time they were highly detailed, and I felt that if only my eyes would focus, I would get some meaning out of them. It never really happened. I felt somewhat angry at my eyes because they couldn't focus on anything. To give you an idea of the kind of hallucinations that occurred, you can do this little trick. Take a camera with a flashbulb in a totally dark room. Now, looking straight ahead, take a picture with the flash on. The flash will reveal all the furniture and stuff in the room, which will be very bright at first but will then fade into very detailed pictures of the objects. This is the picture burned into your retinas. However, in my hallucinations, the images would be totally arbitrary pieces of furniture and other objects, as well as imagined images, which had no way of getting into my retinas. This was somewhat concerning, but I realized I was tripping so I had fun and went along with it. If I had both eyes open, I found it very difficult to hallucinate from all the sensory input since my stereoscopic vision was totally gone. E.g., 
seeing double. I would occasionally close one eye, which would boost me into a totally vivid, yet non-spatial hallucination, which would be dissolved slowly when I opened my other eye. I could merge with reality, but only if I moved from my current location. The more I stayed in one place, the more I hallucinated and transformed the environment. At some point, I noticed that I now had the ability to concentrate thought enough to change my surroundings, totally fooling my senses into thinking I was somewhere I was not. I began staring at the wall across from me. I noticed how the paneling, although I didn't know it was paneling at the time, was in the shape of a window. So I thought it must actually be a window instead of a wall. Just then, the white wall slowly faded into a blackish blue night sky color. And I could see billions of stars out of beyond the now transformed wall. I resolved that if the only thing I could see from this window were the stars, was that I must be somewhere very high up in the night sky. Then I felt as if I was seated at the very top of a tall, clear window elevator. The perception of it seemed absolutely realistic. And the entire room seemed to be equally transformed into this delusion. At some point, my friend, who was lying on a bed directly in front of the wall, had shifted position, causing the illusion to be distorted in a manner I couldn't exactly call visual. It caused me to decide to snap out of the hallucination and to tell him what I had seen. However, I only managed to blurt out, Whoa, I just had a major hallucination. Across the room from me was a digital clock. I don't really think I noticed the clock at first, but eventually I began hallucinating in a most fascinating manner. I had closed my eyes, or at least I perceived it as having my eyes closed, and I was having mild hallucinations which were very dark. Not evil, just not well illuminated. Eventually, I would notice these detailed red entities, which could be best described as electronic dogs. They were red neon outlines of pixelated dogs, which would roll around and just generally frolic with each other. After a while, I tried to focus my non-responsive eyes in on them in order to determine what kind of creatures they were. To my surprise, they suddenly melted into one another and turned into the current time. The time then floated back to where its normal position was and the entire room faded back into focus. I would shut my eyes again, only to have the same process repeated. I imagined this was the loss of my stereoscopic vision, for the most part. But some of the motions that these images acted out would indicate my eyes were doing complete rotations in my eye sockets. Occasionally, when one of my friends would say something, I would be totally unaware that they had even spoken at all, if it hadn't been for their mouth moving. Generally, this applied only to one-word responses. If they were to spit out an entire sentence, I would understand what they said for the most part. At some point, I needed to take a piss, so I went into the bathroom. Avoiding the evil mirror, I made my way, very slowly, over to the toilet and started going. I looked over to the shower, which was dark. After a couple of seconds, it phased out and looked like someone was in it, and that the shower was actually a medium-sized room. The illusion of a person standing behind the curtain seemed so realistic. I recall trying to speak to it, thinking it was one of my drunken friends playing a trick on me. I thought this was only because I saw the curtain move. However, after I was done, 
I swatted at the curtain and saw that there was nothing there. So I went back into the room. I recall thinking about both sex and murder. Both seemed very, very curious for me. And the punishment for committing murder seemed totally frightened when compared to the crime. Time seemed tenfold more important than life. And serving such a long period of time without freedom seemed utterly terrifying when compared to the absolute freedom granted by death. This thought scared me because I thought it had turned me psychotic or something. Don't get me wrong. It's not like I wanted to grab a knife and butcher my friends. Murder was still totally revolting, but for different reasons. Now it just didn't make any sense. I thought a good deal about suicide as well. Again, I didn't want to commit it, but I truly looked at it and thought about it. It felt as if it was a way to escape the hidden trivialities of life, the aspects that our brains conceal from us with every waking moment. This thought was very frightening, at least in retrospect, and I decided to stop thinking about such things. I recall some talk of sex, and it seemed totally arbitrary to me. I just didn't get it for some reason. I also recall that I had virtually no sex drive at the time. When sometime during the night, I moved to the living room, I noticed that while staring at the carpet, it would take on different properties. At first, it was just a basic rug. But after staring at it for a few seconds, it seemed to be covered with a purplish electricity field and would then convert to a different texture. At first, it turned into some broken and jagged bricks, and after about 15 seconds, it went back to normal. Then it became encapsulated in the electricity field and became the carpet from my room at home. This illusion lasted for what seemed like about 10 minutes. When I asked my friend if his carpet had any textures on it, he said that it didn't. That eventually broke the hallucination and I decided to travel back to the previous room. In the room we had a small tape deck which was playing Metallica. I find great comfort in music while DXM tripping because it tends to tie me to reality, as well as being more interesting than usual. However, music becomes less of a sensory input and more of a decoration while I was at this stage. It's hard to explain. At some point, I recall stating that the music was like a poster on the wall. It was totally one-dimensional and flat. It seemed as if it couldn't get very far from the speaker that was emitting it without falling to the ground. This was very fascinating, and I found great delight upon realizing this. I decided to go to sleep. It felt like it had been about two days since I first started. When I closed my eyes, I was still hallucinating. This didn't bother me, however. I was having a blast. Suddenly, right in the middle of some other hallucination, I noticed I was able to separate myself from my body and was truly able to view myself from the third person. This was extremely disturbing since I had never looked in on myself from the outside before. Whenever I touched my face, my legs, or my arms, they felt alien and unusual. My skin felt as if it was not my own. I noticed that pain was totally gone in the form I had known, and was more of a signal from my body than a hurtful force. My friend advised me not to test this by hurting myself, and I took his advice. I forget when, but eventually, I fell asleep. When I woke up about eight hours later, I was still tripping. I couldn't see very straight, and I still felt heavily intoxicated. 
It was now 12 noon on Sunday, and I had begun tripping on 9 p.m. Saturday. My pupils were practically the size of my entire eyeball. My skin was flushed pale white, and I was totally spent. I had a hard time moving around without looking like a character from the Night of the Living Dead. However, I resolved that I had to get home to rest up. Against better judgment, I bid farewell to my friends and went to my car. The drive home was frightening. Never drive under the influence of DXM, or under the influence of anything for that matter. The landscape seemed to come up to greet me, and I felt like I was going about two miles per hour, despite that the speedometer said I was going 55. Finally, I got home and crawled into bed. I watched a few movies that I still can't remember and slept for another five hours or so. When I got up, I was still slightly buzzed and decided to sleep the rest of the night. When I got up the next day, I was totally re-energized and felt as if I was on top of the world. To tell you the truth, I had one of the greatest times of my life on this trip, but I wouldn't recommend it for a first trip. It would be easy to think you're dying if you're not prepared. I felt very enlightened from this experience and had a fine afterglow for the next couple of days. All in all, I would say that I love DXM, but not to the point of addiction. It's a great psychedelic, and I'm glad that I tried it, and feel wiser after having tried it. Entering the Second Plateau A few days ago, I decided it would be a good idea to test the waters of DXM. I've had one relatively good trip on it at 120 milligrams, which was relaxing, euphoric, really enhanced the trippy playlist I made, and overall wasn't that bad of a time. Fast forward three to four days later, I had a little bit of Robocough left, along with another full bottle, and decided, fuck it, I'm free tomorrow, might as well see the dextroverse, and planned to dose enough to reach a second plateau. I poured the Robocough in a measuring cup, then into my water bottle, and mixed it with some A&W, starting off with 120 milligrams. I chilled on my couch, switching between YouTube and Netflix while waiting for the come up. Last time it took about 30 minutes to kick in, and I was disappointed when nothing happened in over 30 minutes. I smoked a bowl and redosed. This time, another 120 milligrams. After a couple of episodes of Ash vs. Evil Dead, I got some water and I went to the bathroom. I noticed it was slightly harder to walk, but not to the point where it would be an issue. Just slightly slow and a little less coordinated. Getting back to the couch, I took another hit and got the bright idea to just pour the rest of the DXM in my bottle and down it. A few YouTube videos later, I got up and went back to the bathroom. Even less coordinated slash functional than before, kind of felt like all of my muscles in my legs were slowly giving up on me. Stumbling through my hallway, I pushed myself off the wall and made it inside. Before leaving, I noticed in the mirror, I didn't really look much like myself. My features seemed different and distorted. My skin looked red and puffy. That's when the robo itch kicked in. It wasn't too bad at first, but got progressively more unbearable throughout the night. Walking back out and trying not to scratch, I sat back down and played the most chill music I could think of. I kicked back, relaxed, and checked to see if I had any closed eye visuals, and I did. Tunnels, fractals, it's kind of hard to describe, but it just felt like I was falling down the dextro rabbit hole. My euphoria was cut short when the urge to scratch every part of my body returned only 10 times more intense. I resisted as much as I could, but before I knew it, I was scratching and raiding my cabinets for an antihistamine. After an unsuccessful search, I figured I should eat and get more water. 
Every step was taking about five seconds each, and I was just guessing where my feet would land. I heard my friend Trey's voice telling me to drink more water, bro. Fuck robo-walking to my cup. I drink straight from the sink. As long as I have water, I'll be all good. People can't die while drinking water, my dumbed down mind thought. I said, thanks, even though I knew my friend wasn't actually even at my place that night. I made my way back to the couch from the sink, which takes about four seconds sober, but felt like an eternity on DXM. Tried to land on the cushions, but missed completely. Thank you, Carpeted Four. Another horrible wave of robo-itching hits me, along with uncontrollable muscle spasms and twitching. My cat watches me spaz out on the floor from her favorite chair and blinks at me twice. I do the same. I tried getting into my phone, but my vision was starting to blur and I could barely type my password. Switched to manual breathing not soon after, and my heart spiked up into maximum overdrive. I tried to keep things light in my mind, but with all the symptoms sending me into panic, the euphoria was gone and I just wanted to abort the whole thing. My heart was really put to the test on how fast it can beat, and I started thinking, about my potential obituary. He died getting fucked up on cold med. I was determined not to let this be the end. I told my cat I love her, then gathered my strength to get up. Eventually, I did. The itching, racing heart, shallow breaths, twitching, general feeling of impending doom, all intensified as I hugged the wall and made my way through my dark hallway for a final trip to the bathroom. My hall felt like a nightmarish tunnel of darkness slash hopelessness this time. More auditory hallucinations intensified with every step. I heard different versions of my own voice slash personas and emotions. Again, hard to explain. Some encouraged me to make it through this. Others were nonchalant and didn't care what happened either way. And a few condemned me for every mistake I made leading up to the trip telling me I deserved to feel this way and replayed every mistake I've made in my mind. You brought this on yourself. Flashes of all the times I've ever hurt someone emotionally, verbally, etc. Specifically fights with loved ones. How I've taken them for granted. I'm sorry, was all I can manage to say. Finally making it through to the bathroom, I checked myself in the mirror. I knew who I was as an individual, but my mind and body were separate. I was a soul controlling an individual I didn't really care for. Really, I gotta be this guy? After a few minutes, or potentially longer, of staring at my reflection, I collapsed into the sink and threw up. I woke up again what felt like 15 to 20 minutes later and went to my room. Actually getting into my phone this time, I kept playing chill music, twitching and convulsing by the trash can in my room the rest of the night heart still racing a mile a minute. I thought about the good memories with my friends and loved ones. Their voices filled my head. It helped a bit as I laid there restless for hours, praying that I'd be normal again soon. I tried eating, but couldn't keep anything down, so just kept myself as hydrated as I could. Eventually, I saw the sunlight shine through my blinds and spent the next few days recovering. Overall, I'm glad I had this experience. It opened my eyes and made me appreciate the people I have in my life and having good health in general. I hope all of you learn from your experiences and be much more careful than I was. My first DXM trip. Date, June 18th, 2016. Time of dosage, around 5.30pm. Gender, male. Weight, 73 kilograms are 160 pounds. Age, 17. Setting, at my house. Obtain the DXM. I walked into CVS by myself and spent a good 5-10 to 10 minutes looking through their cough syrup for just what I needed. It was dextromethorphan polyterix, which is the longer acting form of DXM. This detail was unimportant to me at the time. First dose. I was originally going to take only a low dose of about 120 milligrams, but I decided that I was going to be okay with a higher dose my first time because when I took LSA for the first time, I took 800 morning glory seeds 
and it was an amazing time. So I downed about 250 milligrams, which is half the bottle. Second dose. About 30 minutes after the first dose, I decided that 250 milligrams wouldn't be enough for me, so I drank the rest of the bottle. So now there's 535 milligrams in me. Everything was going well. I laid in bed while listening to music and closing my eyes, waiting for the geometry to start. The geometry gradually set in and at this point, it's 45 to 60 minutes after the second dose. Uh oh. I started feeling like I was dying. It's funny when I think back on it, but while it was happening, I was like, yeah, this is it. While making my way to the bathroom, everything was slower than I've ever seen it, like 3 frames per second. Everything felt very distant, and I got the bright idea of getting in the shower. Probably the worst thing I could have done. I had never experienced dissociation like this before, besides laughing gas at the dentist, so I didn't know what to expect. I got in and turned on the water, and I couldn't feel what temperature the water was. Now I'm really starting to flip out. I get out of the shower and go to the laundry room and throw up in the toilet. My heart was racing and I didn't know what to do. I told my mom that I was sick and I needed to go to the hospital and she said okay. So I went to the hospital and was there until about 2am. I specifically remember hearing voices while I was there. One of the voices said that something happens once every 1000 years. No idea what that's supposed to mean. The universe was probably trying to tell me that I messed up. Conclusion: This trip ended up lasting about 4 days. Every time I would wake up, everything was still 3 frames per second. I knew now that I have the CYP2D6 deficiency. I only need to take 120 milligrams to have a good trip with geometry that will last at least 2 days. Fascinating DXM It was a Friday in early November. After picking up my check from work and cashing it in at the bank, I took a trip to the CVS on my way back home. I didn't feel a need to buy the name brand Robitussin over the bargain brand. They both contain the same ingredients, so why bother? Neither did I want to buy the syrup. I never tried the syrup, but I've heard one too many instances of vomiting from it. So instead, I purchased one bottle of 20 gel caps, 300 milligrams. It was the only product that was secured in a clear, theft-proof plastic box, unlike the rest. Walgreens didn't keep their decks imprisoned behind a plastic box, however. I bought one bottle of bargain brand Tussin from there too, so as not to arouse suspicion buying multiple bottles at either store. Conveniently, the Walgreens was immediately across the street from CVS. Competitors think alike, I suppose. I did DXM three times before that day, the first time being 300 milligrams at his house, the second time 600 at mine, and the third time being 600 again at my house, except I was alone. I understood the effects of DXM quite well, with the drunken sensation invoked during the come up, then a bout of vomiting, followed by the good parts of the trip. This time, though, I wanted to push more pills down. The second time I tripped, the one at my house with my friend Mason, name changed for privacy, he had leftover DXM. I figured I would add that on to what I looted from the pharmacies. Thus, I was going to drop 750 milligrams the next day, Saturday. I texted Mason to inform him I raided the store for DXM and I asked him if he wanted to join me. This would be the second time he would do it. He said maybe. Nonetheless, we arranged to meet the following afternoon. It was a partly cloudy and cool Saturday afternoon when Mason and I went hiking. We smoked some weed and discussed the details of what would happen that evening. He changed his mind about doing the DXM since he had some wine he intended on having with his weed instead. Shortly after grabbing some takeout and settling into his house at 6, I got to swallowing the 50 pills, three at a time, with my food. I expected it to be more difficult getting the pills down, but since I had food with me, it was easier. Mason's dad was concerned that I would vomit. I thought I wouldn't, since the last time I did DXM, I was able to resist vomiting by meditating. I figured I would do the same this time. I told him about that, and he wished me luck. 
disappearing into his bedroom to leave Mason and I alone with the PlayStation 2. The effects of the pills began to set in about a half hour after I took them. It was just as I had expected, the drunken sensation. It was as if I had slammed four or so drinks into my system. While the game was paused, Mason went to chat with his mom a couple rooms away in her bedroom. After going to interrupt them for a bucket, just in case I was going to vomit, I continued to remain as still as a statue on the living room couch. I'd meditate like last time. Deep breaths, clear your mind. An acidic heat wave stewed deep in my stomach. I only had to keep my head straight and not panic to avoid the nausea. But despite my attempts to contain myself, I couldn't climb over the hurdle. I took the bucket and vomited profusely into it, hacking out a musty, pinkish liquid of half-digested food and tussin pills. I must have vomited three times before, dry heaving an additional two times. I drank the ice water nearby. Mason returned to the couch and resumed the game. The music Mason and I had playing began to annoy me as I threw up, so I asked him to pause it, and I promptly resumed my silence. I needed to collect myself. It wasn't long before I was talking fine. Mason said something like, I see you're doing a lot better now, to which I agreed. It was about seven when the vomiting stage ended. I knew smooth sailing was coming after this. The peak came on to me. I laid out on the couch when I said, this feels weird, to Mason as he drank glass after glass of wine. I began slurring to Mason about a psychedelic and wobbly, weird type of song, Last House in the Enchanted Forest by Black Moth Super Rainbow, as I began playing it. I felt as if my peripheral vision widened or that my sight bulged outward as a fish eye lens with a black ring around it. The next thing I remember, I was looking at the room from a different perspective. It was as if my sight was zoomed out with black letter boxes surrounding the room as I looked inward to it. I began to slur heavily or talk robotically with my words coming out long and drawn out. I felt like a robot too, some large and grandiose mind contained in a fragile, disposable body. I don't recall the order of the events following this. I only remember the bits and pieces, but I know I was stuck in a multi-layered other world. My life became a movie, and I was but a moviegoer watching it. I suggested to Mason that we get up. It would be funny and interesting to stand after the both of us were filled with drugs. He rose first, then stumbling to catch his bedroom doorway so he wouldn't fall. I rose next from my couch grave, standing into an odd position. I stood like I took a shit without toilet paper and had my pants around my ankles, ready to waddle around. I did the classic ambivalent robo-walk into the kitchen with Mason to get water. I went to the bathroom. He returned to the living room. Time was moving extremely slow. By the time it was 8, I thought it was 10. This caught me by great surprise when Mason told me the time. I started to climb down from the peak. Mason and I talked having some weed. He told me when he had weed after DXM, it helped him feel better. I took his word for it, and we both smoked a bowl. The weed began to move through the layers of the other world. After each daydream I entered, I returned back feeling like I peeled back another layer. In one of those daydreams, or a very trance-like state as it were, my bodily perception began to either muddy or disappear. I became larger than the universe. The black void of space surrounded a bubble containing galaxies, and I was a bodiless being peering into it. What was I? What is this? This is reality? A profound revelation washed through me when I exited the daydream. With great astonishment in my voice, I told Mason that I thought I had an ego death. For the rest of the night, I began to come down. Just an hour before, I was experiencing that sensation where everything is different, like it was the first time I had been in my friend's house, or that I was stuck in a dream, exiting and entering new ones. But after some more gaming, I crashed on my friend's couch. I slept at 11 p.m., then woke later at 1 a.m. and returned home. I was irritable and groggy from then on until I fell asleep again an hour later. The following morning, I thought again about the trip. I didn't regret it, and I liked it very much, having seen an entirely different perspective of things. It was fun. I couldn't do it again anytime soon, though.
I don't see how anyone could use DXM very regularly since it removes your headspace so far out from reality. Nonetheless, if someone would want to do it, I encourage them to fully understand DXM and conduct their research before beginning, and to consider set, setting, and all the ins and outs before having a good trip. Thought I was dying. 900 milligrams.